Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Buckland. I'm a lecturer working within the Department of Philosophy here at the University of York. And it gives me pleasure to welcome you to today's event as part of York Festival of Ideas Online. Although we are in a clearly different format to previous years, the 2020 York Festival has seen close to 60 inspirational events for all ages over the last two weeks and continues to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. And today's event is no exception. A few technical notes before we begin. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time you like. At the end of the talk, Roman and I will do our very best to get through as many questions as possible. Uh, should you have any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi during the talk, you can rejoin the event at, at any time using the original link that you were provided with. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded so you will be able to watch again. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And without further ado, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Roman Krasnarek. Roman is an acclaimed public philosopher who writes about philosophical ideas and the power they have to change society. He is currently a research fellow of the Long Now Foundation in San Francisco, and he is a founder of the internationally acclaimed Traveling Empathy Museum. He has written a number of hugely influential books, including Empathy, The Wonder Box, and Carpe Diem Regained. His talk this afternoon focuses on some of the central themes from within his forthcoming book, The Good Ancestor, How to Think Long-Term in a Short-Term World. So at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Roman. Thanks very much for that introduction, Jamie, and hello to you all. Um, so as Jamie said, I'm going to share some thoughts from this new book of mine, The Good Ancestor, which is about how we can expand our time horizons into the distant future, which I think is so essential at this moment of history. And the place I'd like to begin, if you can throw your minds back that far to before COVID-19, towards the end of last year, at the time of the last UK general election. And back then, my partner and I decided to give our 11-year-old twins an unusual birthday present. We decided to give them our votes. And so we all sat around the kitchen table, debated the various party manifesto, and then the kids told us where to put the X on the ballot sheet. And just in case you're wondering, actually, they didn't exactly follow their parents' political opinions either. But why did we do this? We did it because we live in an age of pathological short-termism where the interests of the generation upon generation of children who will inhabit the future are largely ignored. We know that politicians can barely see past the next election or even the latest tweet, that markets spike and crash in speculative bubbles, businesses can't see past the next quarterly report, nations sit around international conference tables bickering away while the planet burns and species disappear. And as individuals, of course, we're constantly focused on responding to the latest text, buying fast food, pressing that buy now, that buy now button. You know, this is the age of the tyranny of the now. And I think most of us recognize that more long-term thinking would be good for us. We need it for our public health systems. We know that those countries that had long-term pandemic plans in place, uh, such as Taiwan, have dealt with coronavirus more effectively than those countries like the US, which didn't have plans in place. But we also need long-term thinking to tackle the technological threats which lie just over the horizon, whether it's from genetically engineered pandemics or AI-controlled lethal autonomous weapons. And then, of course, there are the threats and risks from 
the ecological crisis, from climate change, from biodiversity loss. We need to get off our short-term addiction to fossil fuels. And in many ways, there's a kind of paradox here, right? Which is that the need for long-term thinking is incredibly urgent. We need it right here, right now. And the way I tend to think about this issue is this, is that I believe that humankind has colonized the future. We see the future as a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump our ecological degradation and technological risk and nuclear waste as if there was nobody there. And it's a bit like the way that when you know, Britain colonized Australia in the 18th and 19th century, they drew on a legal doctrine now known as terra nullius, nobody's land. To, so they treated the continent as if there were no indigenous people there without any land rights or land claims. Of course there were. And I think now we've also shifted from terra nullius to tempus nullius. The future tends to be seen, particularly in wealthy countries, as nobody's time, as an uninhabited territory that's ours for the taking. And I think just as indigenous Australians are still struggling against the legacy of terra nullius, there is a struggle to be had against the doctrine of tempus nullius. And the great tragedy, though, of course, is that future generations aren't here to engage in that struggle. They can't just throw themselves in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi or block an Alabama bridge you know, like a civil rights protester. They are given no place in the political system. They have no rights to the ballot box, no power in the marketplace. And I think one way to try and visualize the tragedy of this situation is this. Let me show you this image, which I call the scale of unborn generations. And it's a, a concept from a, a great writer and journalist called Richard Fisher. So there in the little green circle there, you can see everyone who is alive today, 7.7 .7 billion of us. Now, if we cast our minds back 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But if we look forward 50,000 years, if this century's birth rate levels off remain constant, assuming that, then over the next 50,000 years, nearly 7 trillion people will be born. And you can see there in that giant orange circle, they far outweigh everyone who has ever lived in the last 50,000 years or who's alive today. So there in that orange circle, are all of your children and their children and their grandchildren, your nephews and nieces and all of their children. And I think looking at this, we can ask ourselves, looking at that giant orange circle, you know, what do those future generations, what will, how will they judge us? How will they think about us? How will they remember us for what we, what we did or didn't do when we had the chance? And someone who really thought a lot about this issue was the immunologist Jonas Salk who was a person who, with his team, discovered the polio vaccine in 1955. And later in life, Salk said that the great question facing our time is this. Are we being good ancestors? In other words, are we going to be remembered well by future generations? And he thought that if we were going to be remembered well, and if we were going to tackle the challenges of our time, such as our destruction of the natural world and the threats of nuclear war and things like that, then we would need to expand our time horizons. Instead of thinking on a scale of you know, seconds and minutes and hours, we needed to expand our horizons and think on a scale of decades, centuries, and even millennia. And in many ways, we've been getting rather good at that, right? Um, you know, there are some fantastic long-term thinking and planning projects around. So, for example, there's the Svalbard Seed Vault in the Arctic Circle, which is um, protecting the world's plant biodiversity. They've collected over a million seeds from 6,000 species, and they're being kept in an indestructible rock bunker, which is designed to last for a thousand years. And there are other like cultural projects, such as the 10,000-year clock being built as we speak inside a limestone mountain in the Texas desert. This is a slow time clock, which is designed to last for, uh, to stay accurate for 10,000 years. 
and you're going to be able to visit it by, it's not ready yet, it'll be probably another decade till it's finished, you'll be able to visit it by hiking through the desert uh, to get there and then walking up the mountainside up steps, cut into the side, each of them representing a million years of geological time. And it's almost like a kind of a secular altarpiece to a long-term thinking civilization. Now, as I've been speaking, you may well have been thinking of your own examples of long-term thinking and planning that really inspire you, that think you think are powerful. And what I'd love you to do, if you could do this for me, is just in the Q&A box to jot down uh, an example or two that you've come across of inspiring long-term thinking. Um, it might be something like Jem Finer's um, music uh, piece called Long Player, uh, which is started playing um, in the last seconds of 1999 is going to play for a thousand years. It might be something like the Sagrada Familia uh, Cathedral in Barcelona, uh, which was begun in the 1880s and is going to be finished probably in about five years time, get Gaudi's famous Basilica. Now, I was hoping that I'd be able to see your responses in the Q&A box, but, um, so, oh, wait, oh, here's some things coming up. Someone's just mentioned Norway's uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. Right, which is based actually quite a complex example because it's based on their oil and gas reserve funds. Um, and uh, you know, there's about $200,000 for every Norwegian person in there. It's, it's earmarked for future generations. Uh, that um, there's a, people, someone's mentioned the pyramids, the Voyager missions, you know, in the 1970s that went out, which are still going into space. So there's some, some fantastic examples. Um, Helen has just mentioned just planting trees, an example I like because I used to be a gardener at an Oxford college and we planted trees that we knew would never, we'd never see um, in our lifetimes fully grow into maturity. So there's lots of examples there and I'm sure more will come up and you've thought of more. Um, but I think, you know, at this point, what I'd like to do is start thinking about how we can get better at this long-term thinking. And I can see more examples coming up in the chat box there and uh, we'll come back to some of those. But I wanna talk about four different ways we can get better at long-term thinking, sort of master the art. These are just a few of the ways that are explored in the book. And these have to do with um, our brains, with our capacity for planning, with our legacies and with our politics. And the place I'd like to start now is inside our brains. So in the human mind, in most of our minds, there's a constant tug of war for time going on between the drivers of short term and long term thinking. You know, do we party today or save for our pensions for tomorrow? Do we upgrade to the latest iPhone or plant a seed in the ground for posterity? And the short term part of our brain has been very deeply studied and um, it's about at least 80 million years old. We share it with other animals such as rats. And this short term part of the brain is the bit that focuses on instant, uh, you know, short, uh, instant uh, short term gratification, instant rewards. And let me show you what it looks like. It looks like this. I call it the marshmallow brain. And we've all got one. And it's named after, of course, the famous marshmallow test from the 1960s, where kids had a marshmallow placed in front of the table in front of them. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow, but lo and behold, the majority would snatch the marshmallow. They couldn't resist. But the marshmallow brain is only part of the story of who we are because there's another part of our brain, and it's this. Let me bring it up close to the camera if you can see it there. It's the acorn brain, and we've all got one, and it lives here uh, in the frontal lobe at the front of our heads, particularly in a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain which is particularly uh, wired for long-term thinking and planning and strategizing. It's a new part of the brain, the human brain at least. It's only, we've only had it for, been developing for the last two million years or so. And it's more developed in humans than almost any other animal. So other animals do plan a bit. So a chimpanzee might get a stick and strip off the leaves to make a tool to stick into a termite hole. But a chimpanzee will never make a dozen, dozen of these tools and set them aside for next week. But that is precisely what a human being will do. We are planners extraordinaire. We are masters of the temporal pirouette. We can be thinking in an instant about answering a text in the next moment, thinking about saving for our children's education or what music we want played at our own funerals. Um, and of course, it's this acorn part of the brain which has allowed us to going back to some of the examples people mentioned earlier, things like building the pyramids, voyaging into space. 
So my first point really is this, is that let's remember we're not just short-term marshmallow snatchers, we're long-term acorn thinkers. We need to tell a new story about human nature, that we have this amazing ability to become part-time residents of the future. It's the acorn part of the brain and let's learn to use it. But then there's a question, and this is my second point, well, how do we put that acorn brain into practice? And that leads me to the, the concept of cathedral thinking. You may have heard of this, it's the idea of embarking on projects with extremely long time horizons, sometimes decades, even centuries. It's named in honor of those medieval cathedral builders who would embark on, on building their religious houses of worship, knowing that they may never be finished within their own lifetimes. Greta Thunberg, of course, has said that we'll need cathedral thinking to tackle the climate crisis. Um, and one of the interesting things about cathedral thinking is that if you look, look at it historically, it's taken some rather different forms. And let me just show you an image of some of these. So one kind of cathedral thinking you can see there in the top left-hand corner is about literally building religious buildings. And the example there is one I love, which is Alm Minster, a Lutheran church in Southwest Germany, which was begun in 1377 when the, the citizens of Alm decided they wanted to have their own church. They built it themselves, financed it themselves. Well, it took them more than 500 years to finish it. It wasn't completed until 1890. But as, long as, as well as religious buildings, there's also what you can see on the right, which is public works projects. That image shows the Victorian sewers masterminded by the uh, engineer, Sir Joseph Bazalgette, who you can see standing at the top on the right there with a, a top hat on. And as you may know, in the 1840s and 50s, um, London faced um, uh, health pandemics or epidemic with cholera outbreaks and diphtheria and other diseases because of the polluted uh, water, that raw sewage was being pumped into the Thames. Sometimes tens of thousands of people would die every year. But in the year 1858, the year of the so-called Great Stink, the stench coming off the Thames, because you know people were drinking their own water at that time and they could smell it, but the smell was so bad in 1858, in the summer of 1858, it wafted into the Houses of Parliament and even MPs couldn't breathe or hold their meetings. They had to have masks over their faces, something we know all about now. And they finally, with that moment of crisis, passed legislation so that Bazalgette could build the sewers, finance the sewers. He spent over 19 years with 22,000 workers, 318 million bricks to complete those sewers. And the amazing thing is the, Victor the Victorian sewers of London are still in use today because Bazalgette was a long-term thinker. He built them twice as big as they needed to be. In a way, that's not really cathedral thinking. I think of it more as sewer thinking. And then in the bottom left-hand corner is a third kind of cathedral thinking, which is the actions of social and political movements, which have long, very long time horizons. Think of the suffragettes. The first suffragette organization was formed in 1867 in Manchester, and it was more than 50 years until they finally achieved their aims of votes for women. So all of these different examples, I think, should give us inspiration. You know, we're really good at this long-term thinking stuff when we put our minds to it, but cathedral thinking is not always good for us. Just think that Adolf Hitler wanted to create an a thousand year Reich, or think of those dictators who want to preserve their power and privilege for their children and for all future generations, like the North Korean, political dynasty. Or even in the corporate world, you know, former head of Goldman Sachs, Gus Levy, once said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Well, those kinds of cathedral thinking are very narrow. They're not thinking about, you know, everybody in that big orange circle I showed earlier. They're incredibly self-interested. So we've got to think of how do we widen cathedral thinking in our long-term thinking. And that brings me on to my third point, which is to consider the legacies that we leave, our personal legacies. Now, if you look back through history, we are the inheritors of extraordinary legacies and gifts from the past, from those who planted the first seeds in Mesopotamia 10,000 years ago, those who built the cities where we still live, who made the medical discoveries uh, that we benefit from, who created the great works of art and literature, literature that have been passed down to us. But equally, we are their inheritors of quite negative legacies from the past too, from our, one might think of as bad ancestors, like the, the prejudices and racism which have been handed down to us from colonial era 
um, st power structures, which we find embedded in our criminal justice systems today has been so starkly brought out by the Black Lives Matters movement. But all of this raises a question really, of, well, what legacies are we going to leave for future generations? What gifts, what might we want to pass on? Now, the thing about human beings is that when we reach midlife, we tend to start thinking about our legacies, about keeping the fire of our own life burning beyond death. But we tend to express our legacies in very different ways. Some people opt for a very egocentric form of legacy, um, about wanting to be memorialized for their personal achievements, like a, a Russian oligarch who wants a wing of the National Gallery named after them. Most of us opt for a familial form of legacy, wanting to pass on property to our children or pass on culture or languages or, or traditions or, or religion. But I think if we're going to be good ancestors, we need to widen our sense of legacy to what I think of as transcendent legacy. That's the idea of leaving a legacy for the universal strangers of the future, people we may never know, never meet, completely unrelated to us. Now, making that leap to transcendent legacy is quite difficult, especially because we live in a highly individualistic culture. We're cut off from future generations, unlike many other cultures, like in some Native American cultures, there's the idea of seventh generation thinking, making decisions based on the impact of seven generations from today. So how do we make that connection now? Well, I'd like to offer you an imaginative thought experiment to help with this that I call the great chain of life. Um, it's inspired by some great long-term thinkers called Ella Saltmarsh and Hannah Smith. And the way it goes is like this. What I'd like you to do for me actually is to just for a moment now, just sit back and just close your eyes for a moment and imagine a child that you really care about, someone from a younger generation than you, like a nephew or niece or a, one of your kids or something like that. Just picture their face for a moment. Now I'd like you to imagine them 30 years in the future. Again, picture their face what their joys are. Think about what struggles they may face and what's going on in the world around them 30 years from now. And now still with your eyes closed, imagine them on their 90th birthday party and they're surrounded by family, and friends and neighbors and all work colleagues. And as they're standing there, somebody comes over and puts a tiny baby into their arms. And it's their first great grandchild. And they look down at this little baby, they look into its eyes and they think to themselves, what kind of future will it have? And what support will it need to survive and thrive into the years and decades ahead? Now just open your eyes again and consider that that tiny baby could live well into the 22nd century. In other words, their future isn't science fiction. It's an intimate family fact, only a couple of steps away from your own life. And doing that kind of imaginative thought experiment can be quite confronting, especially if you've got a dark vision of the future. Um, but I think it's very a powerful way of getting in touch with future generations. And certainly for me, what I see there is that I see that that little baby is not all alone, but is part of a whole web of relationships, a web of human relationships and communities, and part of a web of relationships in the natural world, the air that it breathes, the food that it eats. And I think if we care about that baby's life, we need to care about leaving a legacy for all life, a gift for all of those people and for the living world. If this is a way of moving from familial to transcendent legacy. And a really great example of it, I think, an art project which I love is something called the Future Library, which is a project, a 100 year art project from the Scottish artist Katie Patterson. And it began in 2014, you may have heard of it. Um, every year for 100 years, a famous writer is depositing a book which will be kept in secret, unread, under wraps in the future library until the year 2114, at which point the 100 books will be printed on paper made from a, a thousand trees which have been planted in a forest outside Oslo. The first person to donate a book was Margaret Atwood, Elif Shafak, and many other 
by well-known writers have donated since. And just think, Margaret Atwood is never going to see that book published herself. She'll be long gone. She's never going to meet those readers. And I think that's an extraordinary gift to the future. And I think we can all ask ourselves, you know, what gifts do we want to leave for future generations? And also ask ourselves, well, what might our descendants wish we had done better for them? And that leads me on to my fourth and final point, which is about politics. We need to move from the personal to the political and think about long-term thinking in the sense of reinventing democracy itself. We know it is insanely short-termist, but there's good news. There's some really exciting long-term thinking projects and programs and initiatives going on around the world. You may know that Finland has a parliamentary committee for the future, or um, in Wales, there is a future generations commissioner, uh, Sophie Howe, whose job it is, is to scrutinize legislation for its impact on future generations. And in fact, right now, there is a campaign called Today for Tomorrow going on to establish a future generations commissioner for the whole UK. It was started by John Bird, the founder of The Big Issue magazine. It's been introduced into Parliament as a future generations bill. And I urge you to support Today for Tomorrow. And I'm really inspired by things like this, because I used to actually be a political scientist many years ago. And in my 10 years, apparently as an expert on democratic governments, it never once occurred to me that we disenfranchise future generations in the same way we once disenfranchised slaves and women in the past. Yet that's exactly what we do and what we need to overcome. And for me, one of the most inspiring examples of democratic redesign in this field is something called the future design movement in Japan. And let me just show you a picture of it. And the way future design in Japan works is that it's a bit like a citizen's assembly uh, with, with sort of random citizens coming together, a bit like they had in Ireland. But the way it works is citizens are invited to a meeting to discuss plans for their town or city, and they're divided into two groups. The first group are told that they're citizens from the present day, and the second group are told that they're citizens from the year 2060. They're told to imagine themselves from 20, being in 2060, and they're given these sort of beautiful ceremonial kimonos to wear to help them in this imaginative journey. And it turns out that the citizens from 2060 come up with much more radical plans for their towns and cities than the current citizens. More radical plans in terms of environmental policy, health policy, education, employment. And certainly I think that we ought to be spreading this future design methodology throughout local government in Britain. The future design movement in Japan wants to establish a ministry of the future. In the UK, I'd also like to see the abolition of the House of Lords and a replacement by something like a house of the future based on this future design model. I think that's the way we're going to start decolonizing the future. So there are four, just four ways, and I explore six and more actually in my book, ways of expanding long-term thinking. It's about switching on your acorn brain. It's about cathedral thinking. It's about transcendent legacy and about reinventing democracy. And let's remember, just to finish up now, that at this moment of history, it's an extraordinary moment of history. It's a moment of crisis and opportunity. You know, the economist Milton Friedman, who I don't quote very often, once said that you know, only a crisis, real or perceived, produces genuine change. And I think that's a pretty good historical rule of thumb. We know out of the crisis of the Second World War came pioneering long-term institutions like the NHS, like the World Health Organization, like the European Union. And I think we need to similarly think big and long to create new institutions for this moment of crisis, new long-term institutions to tackle the climate crisis, the technological threats, the deeply embedded prejudices and racism in our police and judicial systems. And I think if we do that, if we become wise thinkers and long thinkers, we will become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. And with that, I'd like to stop and bring um, back Jamie and let's have a bit of discussion. Thank you, Rob. That was excellent. Okay, so we've had some questions uh, starting to come in. Uh, the first one I think I'm gonna choose comes from Anna Rose. So, who's asking, does it count as long-term thinking if your demands simply aren't met for decades or even centuries? For instance, Black Lives Matter movement and the women's suffrage movement. Yeah, that's a fascinating question, um, Anna. Thanks for that. I mean, I think that 
what we know from the history of social movements is that they very rarely achieve their aims within months or, or years. And, you know, at least half a century tends to be a, a rough rule of thumb for a lot of the struggles in human history in, in the, the era since the rise of rights in the late 18th century, whether that's the, the struggles against slavery and the slave trade, the suffragettes that you mentioned uh, in your question. And I think, of course, the, the struggles um, are against um, racial prejudice and what's represented by the Black Lives Matter movement have been going on for decades. And I certainly do think it is long term thinking still if you are engaged in those struggles, even though you know they're not going to be achieved in the very near future, but in the long term future. I think that's the whole point of having these visions of a better world based on a more equal world, a more just world. I mean, someone like, you know, Karl Marx, for example, thinking of working class. Um, political actions. You know, he never thought that his workers' paradise was going to be achieved immediately. And you know, the trade union movement continues to struggle for those basic rights. And I think that's still going to be the case. But it takes incredible energy and commitment to maintain that uh, long-term vision. And of course, one needs to be having, getting short-term wins as well to keep social movement activity vibrant and to keep it going. Okay, next up is a question from Rebecca, who says, look, I suppose people used to see time in terms of eternity and consequences for our behavior in terms of everlasting bliss or damnation in hell. Do you think that that helps or does it distract from what's going on in the, in the physical world? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, certainly if you look at medieval conceptions of time and life, there's this idea that, well, maybe we will we'll go to heaven. Of course, some people think that and there will be eternal life. There may be eternal damnation. I mean, quite interestingly, the rise of Christianity, particularly when it started taking off in medieval Europe, introduced a new concept of time. The idea that there was a creation and there was the birth of Jesus uh, and that there may be a second coming switched, I think, human, the human species from cyclical ideas of time to the idea of linear time, to the idea of the arrow of time, where there's the past, the present, and the future. I think truly long-term thinking, in a way, is, requires a return to cycles of life. And we are all engaged in cycles of life, with the cycle of my breath as I speak every few seconds you know, of my heartbeat, but then there's the cycles of the seasons, there's the cycles of the earth, there's the carbon cycle over tens of thousands of years. I think we've lost touch with those cycles. Our cycles now are the cycles of, you know, the fiscal year, you know, the electoral cycle. And, you know, certainly a lot of indigenous cultures have retained the idea of cyclical time. You've got the Balinese calendar, for example, which is a cyclical calendar. So I think ultimately, even if some religions have ideas of eternity, the, the deeper forms of long-term thinking, I think, are embedded in cycl cyclical relationships with the living world. We need to reconnect with the ecological choreography of the planet. Okay. okay, yeah, so that kind of connects to a question from Nisha here, who says, do you think religion can play, uh, or, or what role do you think religion can play in this? Right, so there's a question there. What is the part that religion will play in creating a long-term revolution of the human mind. I mean, I believe that there is a global movement of time rebels emerging. What I mean by that are different movements who are effectively thinking very long-term. I think the climate strike movement is doing that. You know, Greta Thunberg, my 11-year-old twins, who have been on those marches, that's long-term thinking. There are organizations like the Long Now Foundation, California, I'm a research fellow. There's the Black Lives Matter, Matters movement. Think of Leila Saad's book, um, Me and White Supremacy, which has this concept of the good ancestor in the subtitle, how we go to overcome the prejudices of today and leave better legacies for the future. So where does religion fit into all of that? I think it has a central role because religion provides the most powerful sort of way of imagining new futures that humankind has ever invented. You know, visions of heavenly paradises, visions of um, a more integrated and interdependent relationship with the living world, like in, you know, indigenous, with the indigenous Australians, the idea that 
I am the land, I'm part of the land. So I think religion will play a really big role. The question is whether religions will switch on to long-term thinking. I mean, in the Pope's, uh, Pope Francesco's latest encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, he talks about intergenerational solidarity. Um, of course, the Vatican Bank, as far as I know, hasn't yet divested from fossil fuels. So the language is there, but maybe the practice isn't there yet, the long-term practice. Some religions, you know, Buddhism and others have ideas of, um, you know, reincarnation, which has long-termism built into it. But can I say one more thing about this is when I was researching this book, I, I asked the world's, I guess, the world's greatest atheist, Richard Dawkins, what he thought about this issue. Because um, I was saying to hit to Dawkins, I said, Look, there's something really interesting going on that around the world, there are hundreds of thousands of environmental organizations which have emerged over the last 50 years. And most of them, in effect, have Mother Earth as their deity. They may not have it written into their, um, their mission statements. They basically have some idea of a sacred sacredness, of a sacred planet. And so I said to Dawkins, you know, don't you think at this moment of history of ecological crisis that that generating some kind of spiritual connection with the living earth is a good way to try and protect it. And his reply was really, really interesting because you know he's quite a dismissive person. I, I completely was ready for him to say, that's just rubbish. But actually he said, well, look, I don't like the idea of worshiping Gaia, worshiping mother earth. He said, I'd prefer to make the scientific arguments about climate change and its dangers. He said, but I can see instrumental reasons why might, one might want to promote the idea of a kind of spiritual connection with the living planet in order to preserve it. So for even, so even a rationalist like um, Dawkins sees the need for some kind of religion, spirituality as one way of galvanizing action, particularly around the ecological crisis. Great, so I'm gonna try and do a two in one thing here with questions from Nick and Sebastian. So uh, Nick asks, what is it that young people, you know, particularly under 18s can, can do to improve the future of mankind and then you know kind of what duties um, do we perhaps have as parents to, to kind of educate our children um, and you know, teaching them how to think long term perhaps okay great so those two questions so in terms of what can people under 18 do first thing i do if you're under 18 i'd say convince your parents or grandparents to give you their votes you know, I'd love to start a global movement where grandparents said, OK, you're the person who to their grandchildren, you know, their grandparents of their children, you're the pe people who are going to inherit the future. You're the one who's going to inherit the consequences of, of our action. So I will let you take my vote. But I think that's only a beginning. Of course, there's social action like taking part in um, you know, political movements. I was in the Black Lives Matter um, protests just uh, a few days ago in Oxford, where I live in Oxford in the UK, um, not Oxford, Mississippi. And there were lots of kids there. It was all about bringing down a statue of Cecil Rhodes, you know, an architect of apartheid. Lots of kids there as, as, as part of that, uh, from lots of different backgrounds. In terms of what parents should be teaching their children or what schools should be teaching children, there are some amazing um, educational projects focused on long-termism. So in Canada, there's something called Roots of Empathy, which is a program to create empathy with people today, but also with future generations. What they do is they bring a baby into the classroom and the kids sit around the baby and they start talking about the baby. Why is the baby crying or laughing? They try and step into the baby's shoes and they use that as a jumping off point for educational explorations. And one of the things they do is they try and imagine, well, what will this baby's future be and what responsibilities do we have to its future life? So there's all sorts of educational things that be, can be done around long-term thinking. They're definitely not mainstreamed yet, and I'd like to see that happen. Yeah, so another question now from someone anonymous. So how can such thinking be promoted to government ministers who seem, as it, uh, as it were, purely concerned with you know, five-year thinking, so to speak? Yeah, government... Government ministers are a tough nut to crack. In fact, I've got to do a briefing for MPs in a couple of weeks time about long-term thinking. I'm sort of trying to think about what to say to them. I think there's practical stuff like the idea, I mean, if we're talking about government ministers in the UK is to push this idea of having a future generations commissioner for the UK and one that probably has more powers than the Welsh minister who really has the power to persuade. I think uh, uh, a future generations commissioner for the whole UK needs to have 
the power, for example, to take government departments and quangos to court for failing to meet targets like on child poverty reduction or carbon reduction, um, like has been happening in the Netherlands, actually, where there have been legal cases that government's been taken to court successfully for its failure to meet its carbon target. So there's legal mechanisms there, too. I think there's sort of nitty gritty technical stuff. So there's something called discounting, which is uh, a form of sort of mathematical economic reasoning that the treasury uses to make its judgments on whether what will be the future benefits of a long-term investment, for example, in the Swansea Tidal Power Project, which was one that was turned down because the discounting methodology used didn't calculate or include the benefits to future generations more than 60 years from today, even though that renewable energy project would have had big benefits down the line. So you need to be lobbying ministers to change these treasury rules in something called the Green Book. So I think there is work to be done there. Um, but, you know, government ministers, they've got their careers, they've got their election cycles, they've got their Twitter feeds and opinion polls to work to. So it is hard working uh, to extend their time horizons. Okay. So a question now from Rosemary it says, do you have any suggestions for practical steps that might be taken to overcome the immediacy of human self-satisfaction with long-term altruism? So the kind of tension, I suppose, between the marshmallow part of the brain and the, and, and, and the, and the acorn. Acorn, <laughs> marshmallow brain, the acorn brain. Actually, funnily enough, on Saturdays in my family, we have a screen-free day. Um, and today's it, this is an exception <laughs> coming on now and my kids are sort of say what are you doing giving this talk this is a screen free day and of course digital dieting is the most obvious quick fix for trying to overcome those the marshmallowness I mean in my book um, I have I worked, I've got a copy of it here but there's this diagram in in here which is called the tug of war for time and I, I don't know if I can easily show it on the screen um, but what it has on one side are six different um, forms of long-term thinking. You won't be able to see it that well, but it's there. Six forms of long-term thinking. I only talked about a few of them today. And the other side are six drivers of short-termism. One of them is digital distraction. But how do we overcome that? And how do we overcome the deep short-termism built into the human mind? I think it's tough. I mean, one of the ways is to practice deep time thought. There, You can go and visit an ancient tree, uh, with, you know, something that connects you with longer time horizons go hunting for fossils and pick up a 195 year old million year old belemite if you're on the Dorset coast. I mean, these are ways to start thinking longer term, but I actually think a lot of this is about conversation. I think it's about having conversations with people about the long term, about what are the arguments, you know, why should we care about future generations? Groucho Marx famously said, you know, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? Well, let's talk about this stuff. I think those conversations, new public discourse, are the beginnings of stretching our time horizons as individuals and as a society. Okay, so we've probably got time for one or maybe a couple more. So here's one that's kind of very relevant to what's going on today. So do you think that the statues of slave traders should be taken down, even though we can't rewrite history? The answer, I believe they should be taken down. Um, and that's why I was involved in a protest to try and take one down the other day, Cecil Rhodes in, uh, in Oxford, which, you know, I mean, the city I live in has been built on slave, you know, money from the slave trade, money from, you know, apartheid. I mean, Cecil Rhodes was the founder of the, um, you know, De Beers Diamond Corporation, the, the, the library of All Souls College in Oxford was it's called the Codrington Library. That's Codrington. He was a slaver. He owned slaves across the, the Caribbean. So I don't think there are strong justifications for keeping up the, the statues of the slavers. But I think there is still a place for finding ways of um, remembering that history and making that part of education systems and debates and, you know, discussions. Um, you know, in Bristol, I think they're putting the, the statue that was rolled into the river, uh, they're putting it in a museum. I kind of like the idea that if the, the statue could have stayed down in the river and that there was a new tourist attraction, you have to kind of scuba dive down to go and see it. Um, I thought that would be rather nice. Um, but yeah, I do think that these, you know, monuments have power, um, statues have power. Every new regime erects 
um, statues and monuments and national lands and, and all this kind of stuff. This is how it's called the invention of tradition. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have open public discussions about what history we are inheriting and what kind of history we're going to pass on to the next generation. Okay, very quickly, we have time for just one more. Um, and it's from Anna Rose, who says, how can we engage individuals who are perfectly happy with the, the current status quo? So kind of people think, well, look, you know, I have, I've got enough on my plate as it is dealing with my own life and my immediate concerns. And we're talking about trillions of people who, you know, who potentially don't even exist yet. Yeah, so how do we engage people that don't really who are and often of course people are for very good reasons focused on the here and now i mean there are 220 million refugees and, and migrants in the world and they're understandably focused on dealing with their problems now but i think that there are ways of you know getting people to connect with future generations partly of that imaginative exercise i did about imagining a child in the future most people connect with that whether they care about the future or not because a lot of people have children or they know young people or they have nephews or nieces. So that idea of legacy is one conduit to the future. And there are other ways too. I mean, practical things. So for example, there's this great research showing that if you know somebody who has given up flying because of climate change, your 50% of those people fly less as a result. In other words, there's contagion effects uh, that go on, which I think are you know, really important as well. And one final thing I'd say is that in that Japanese future design um, experiment, which I talked about, this methodology for civil society planning in cities, what they find is even people who say that they don't care about future generations, when they imagine themselves in 2060, they're more willing literally to pay more money for their water rates in order to have a better water system for people 50 or 60 years from now. Um, when those who don't imagine themselves in 2060 don't want the water rates to go, on, go up, they want to have them go down. So actually, I think by even the act of imagination, I think, can help us connect with something larger than ourselves. And I put my hope, you know, I recognize the reality of the marshmallow brain, but let's bring the acorn brain into play and make it part of how we think who we are. Okay. And um, we're just about out of time. So I'd just like to add that any questions that weren't answered, uh, Roman will do his best to perhaps answer them and we will post out the responses or perhaps you can, they can follow you on Twitter at Roman Kuznarik. So on that note, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the audience and of York Festival of Ideas to thank Roman for a fantastic, inspirational and thought-provoking session. Uh, for those of you who wish to re-watch today's event, the recording is available on the Festival YouTube channel and can be accessed from the Watch Again uh, section of the Festival website. However, please allow a couple of days for it to appear. If you would like to purchase a copy of Roman's book, The Good Ancestor, it will be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Uh, for more information on book sales, please see the festival website or head directly to foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival of ideas. Finally, uh, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with York Festival of Ideas. Please check out the website, York Festival of Ideas. Dot com for full details of all the events in the festival program. And of course, we would love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversation using the hashtag York Ideas. So from myself, Roman and the Festival of Ideas team, uh, goodbye and I wish you an enjoyable Saturday evening.